I'm Lindsay Thomas with QDMA and I'm here at the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting in Destin, Florida this year, 2012, and I'm talking with Coulter Chitwood, who's a graduate student at North Carolina State University. That's correct. And Coulter, you spoke this afternoon about research you've done recently on fawn predation by coyotes uh, on Fort Bragg military installation in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, now, what was interesting about your talk, and I know you went into uh, the various rates of, of fawn predation, what types of predators, or what the cause of death was, and in many cases, you got you guys kind of had to do a crime scene investigation type reconstruction. Absolutely. Um, and you talked about how you could tell different types of predators based on the evidence you found at the scene of this fawn death. So if if a if a, if a hunter land manager is out there uh, in the spring and finds fawn remains. Share a few of the ideas you guys used to separate the different predators that might help them determine was this a bobcat, was this a coyote, etc. Okay. Well, the first thing, the most important thing, is you have to eliminate the possibility that a coyote scavenged. Um, because, as we know, coyotes not only kill fawns, but they can scavenge fawns or adult deer or whatever. And so the first thing uh, somebody can do in the field is look for an external bite wound. And even though that may not be diagnostic by itself, if if you split it open with a knife and you can identify bruising underneath the bite wound, then that means the fawn was bitten while its heart was still beating. And that leads researchers to believe or conclude that, okay, this is a, a predatory situation. Now we go to the next step. And that's when we start looking at other evidence. Um, in the case of bobcats, they often cache their prize, so to speak. Well, let me ask you this. Hold up a second. I mean, so you're saying if you find puncture wounds, like a bite mark on a neck or something like mm -hmm. that on, on the fawn, you can take your knife, split the skin, peel skin. that back, mm -hmm. and what you'll see is blood sort of collected Like a bruise under the skin. Under the skin. Yep. It'll, it'll be just like, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same as a bruise, but you can't see it through the hair. So you need to split the hide open and peel it back. Same and thing you would find under the hide when you're skinning a deer you've shot with a bow and arrow. Yes, absolutely. The trauma that you see around the wound site, it'll look like that, except instead of being, you know, uh, an arrow hole or a, a bullet hole, it, you might see the in, indentation of like a canine tooth. Uh, and sometimes that's not even apparent because the teeth aren't always penetrating. It's actually the pressure that's, you know, rupturing the muscle and, uh, and causing that bruise. But the fact that that happens leads us to know that that was a killing bite rather than, you know, a bite that was just, I'm a coyote and I'm coming by, there's a dead, a dead fawn, a dead fawn and I'm going to take a bite. That's, that fawn's not going to bruise. You could see the bite, but it's not going to have a bruise associated with it. And so that's, that's the first step is then you know you're dealing with the predation. And then to answer your question from before, the next step is what other evidence do you have to assign blame? And you know, across much of the southeast, you know, for, so for most of our deer hunters in this region, it's usually going to be a coyote or a bobcat. And bobcats often cache their their uh, their kill uh, under leaf litter or debris, and it'll be that'll be above ground. In other words, the mineral soil will not be disturbed; it won't be buried. That if that happens, that starts going toward coyotes. But if it's above the ground and you've got leaf litter and debris piled on it, maybe maybe it's stuck behind a brush pile or in a, a, a down tree, that leads us toward uh, blaming a bobcat. Um, whereas the ones we're finding at Fort Bragg, um, the ones that tend to be more coyote-like, they've actually consumed most of the carcass already and, and often don't have anything cached at all. Okay. Um, and then, as you know, from a research standpoint, we are taking it a step further and doing DNA analysis, but the hunter would not not be able to uh, take a swab and send the DNA off to be tested. Right. But from a research standpoint, that allows me to corroborate what we think happened in the field, and that makes our data more rigorous. And in your study, you found far more coyotes, or far more deaths of fawns were attributed to coyotes than any other cause of death. That's correct. Our, our worst case scenario after one year of data, um, I think it ended up being as high as 44%. Like I said, we're waiting on some of that DNA to corroborate, but in the worst case scenario, 44% of, of our fawns were killed by coyotes. Um, so that number could come down a little bit, but um, it will, it'll range somewhere between 20 and 40% uh, based on what we know right now You know, at Fort Bragg. Um, and then we're gonna do it again this year and see how it turns out, of course, and then compare to other studies you know, in the Southeast and then nationwide. Okay, great. Well, thanks for talking with us and uh, great job on your presentation today. Thank you. No problem.